it's a, an honor for me to be here today and uh, to, rather than present all the recent data to sort of give an overview of uh, the controls of food intake and how they're integrated uh, between metabolic and non-homeostatic uh, uh, systems. So e each day, each of us have uh, a lot of questions to answer. Uh, we don't think about them cognitively. We want to know when to eat, what to eat, how much to eat. We have other questions, where to eat, with whom to eat. But we're going to focus upon uh, these today. And even though most of you probably think that you consciously uh, make these decisions, um, that just isn't always the case. I'm going to talk about when to eat and how much to eat. And uh, Drs. Breslin and uh, Avina are going to talk about what to eat. And Dr. Gomez Penilia is going to talk about, then in turn, what food does to the brain. So why do we eat? I mean, I think it's a simple question. And, you know, I've been trained to think that we eat for homeostatic purposes, to uh, get the energy that we need to run the body. And uh, if that's true, then over the long run, then how much we eat should somehow be reflected in uh, how much uh, energy expenditure we expend. And we'll talk about that. But, but the alternative view, of course, is, and they're not mutually exclusive by any means, is that we eat for non-homeostatic reasons. We eat because of food, I mean, of hedonics and palatability, of habits. Uh, many of us get up in the morning and eat a breakfast at the same time. We eat for uh, opportunity. I rarely eat breakfast, actually, but I came in and saw this buffet out here, and uh, I ate some. I mean, you know, that's opportunity, just sitting right there. We eat for social reasons. People get together. Somebody prepared a meal for us, those, those kind of things. But there's lots of non-homeostatic reasons why uh, we need to eat. And what I'm going to be talking about today is how these uh, systems interact. So I'm, I study a lot about the receptors and neurotransmitters and hormones and brain circuits that have to do with eating, but I'm not going to talk about those today. In fact, this is going to be about as sophisticated as my brain gets right here in, in more ways than one at my age. Hormonal signals. Uh, influence the brain, that these are uh, homeostatic signals. They act mainly in the hypothalamus. They also act directly in the brainstem. The brainstem is important because our behavior really comes out of there, whether we eat or don't eat, chewing, picking up the fork. That's sort of the final common pathway for eating. Superimposed on this brain, um, are the non-homeostatic systems of the brain. And, you know, I list here anxiety, social factors, learning, all of these kind of things. And what's important is that these and drugs of abuse and other things like that utilize exactly the same overlapping circuits uh, to control behavior. And an important question is, because of the interlap, uh, or the overlap, is there interference between the two? How does it get along? And, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. This is the dilemma why we're interested in this, of course. Over time, in, in many individuals, and certainly in populations, body weight has uh, been going up. We call this the uh, epidemic of obesity in, uh, uh, in many publications. I'm not going to talk per se about obesity, I just want to make a couple of quick points about it. One is it's certainly not novel. I mean, people like to show these uh, uh, photos of uh, statues of goddesses from, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, and for the most part, many of them are obese, simply indicating that obesity is not a, a modern phenomenon in that sense. It's, uh, the incidence is increasing, as I say. Many people think that this represents a failure of, uh, of the regulatory systems in our brain. I mean, why else could this be happening? And for the most part, food intake is involved. I think that most instances of obesity can uh, result from uh, 
overindulgence of food. It isn't that that's the only way it can happen, but certainly the most common way. Now, I was taught, and I used to believe, in fact, in this system, I mean, certainly I believe in the physics of this system, that if our weight is going to be stable over time, energy intake has to equal energy expenditure. And the question is, is there something in our brain that's making sure that that uh, exists? And one of the studies that uh, influenced me <coughs> early in my uh, career, you can see this was published in 1975, we took four groups of rats. There's a control group that says ad-lib controls, and you can see rats tend to gain weight over their lifetime, and the, the weight went up. And uh, we had three other groups. They got exactly the same food put directly into their stomach every day. We put more food into one group. They were overfed. They became obese. We put a sort of a normal amount in uh, another group, and we gave less food so that other animals wouldn't gain weight in this study. We did this for 135 days, and at the end of that time, we stopped. We let them eat uh, normally, and as you can see, the body weight of all of the groups converged. The animals that had been uh, made obese stopped eating for a while. The ones that had been held at a lower weight overate for a while. And this influenced me a lot. Here were animals. We maintained them for a big chunk of their life at a different weight. As soon as we stopped, they snapped right back, and they did it through their food intake. That's a powerful uh, uh, statement to me. Uh, a point that uh, I want to make about how accurate this system is, if we look at the uh, energy intake of a normal human, like Dr. Breslin, who's going to speak next, probably about 70 kilograms, he eats about a million calories a year, and if he were to gain one pound over the year, that's, you know, you, you guys are much better at these calculations than I am, but that's, that's why I'm, you know, 4,000 calories, not getting the friction into the system. This is a tiny error, four-tenths of a percent. 11 calories a day can lead to that. And as my colleague Randy Seeley always makes a point out, that's the equivalent of one potato chip a day. That's the slippage in order for you to gain one pound uh, a year. And the so-called epidemic of obesity is much less, by the way, than one pound a year. So in spite of the fact that weight is going up, I think we're still mighty uh, accurate in terms of this uh, regulatory homeostatic system. Now, so we have these two sort of opposing views. Experimental evidence says that we're really good at regulating our weight, whereas epidemiological evidence says we're not so good at regulating our weight. And the question is why? Why is there this tension uh, between the two? So how do we eat? Well, we take food in in meals, and meals are the important unit because, as we're going to see in a couple of minutes, ultimately that's where the homeostatic controls over food and steak uh, are exerted. Meal patterns, and by this I mean how many meals a day, when they occur, and so on and so forth. And does it matter if different people have different meal patterns? Can one person be a gorger and eat once a day and expect to maintain the same weight as somebody who's a nibbler and, you know, nibbles throughout the day. Um, and a lot of studies have been done on this, and as I read the literature, as long as you keep things within reasonable limits, it doesn't matter too much. We're incredibly adaptive creatures, and, and if, if the same thing is happening day after day, we are very good at adapting if we eat once a day, three times a day. We'll maintain our weight. Um, over the long run, as long as we're used to it. So, what determines for each of you when you eat, what time of the day, so on and so forth? Do you eat because your blood glucose is low or your stomach is growling and it's telling you that it's time to eat or something like that? Well, I think that the answer is no. I think that we eat because of habits same time every day, uh, so on and so forth. We eat because of convenience. We eat because 
we have a break in our schedule and we grab a bite to eat. We eat because we come home and uh, the person we're living with made a meal for us. I mean, we eat for reasons that don't have to do with, with metabolic deficiencies telling us that we've got to eat. And of course, as I said earlier, we eat for opportunity. This is the only slide I'm going to show you to answer the question of when we eat because it's different for each of us. And it's probably not based, unless we're living on the edge of, of, of death because we don't have enough nutrition, we don't, uh, th there's no cue telling us when it's time to eat. These are all non-metabolic, non-homeostatic uh, reasons. The factors that determine when you start eating are quite different than the factors <clears throat> that determine how much you eat once you begin eating. Quite different signals. This is probably the most important point you can take away. <coughs> we eat not due to some metabolic signal we start eating, but due to the points I just made. How much we eat if there is a metabolic control, this is where it's exerted. It's exerted upon meal size. How many calories we take in once we begin to eat. And as we're going to see, there's a plethora of signals from the body, from the environment, that go into that determination of how much we eat. So what do we know about this? As I say, Historically, people thought that things like blood glucose utilization by the brain or <clears throat> stomach contractions or things like this were the determinants, but that hasn't held up. I think that a breakthrough came in 1973 when uh, a group at Cornell gave the hormone cholecystokine and CCK to rats just before they ate and got them to eat a smaller meal. Here's the experiment in simplified form. Here's a control meal, and here's what happens when you give that rat cholecystokinin just before you eat. The same thing happens in people as it does in these rats, by the way. This was a breakthrough experiment because it led to what I call the modern era of uh, research on the biology of food intake. It's an appealing model. It's sort of a homeostatic model, and, and here it is. If you look in the upper left, you see you're eating food. It goes into your gut, your digestive system. Various things happen to it metabolically, and some of that creates a signal that then goes back and tells the brain how much you've had and you stop eating. And what this paper in the 70s showed was that some of these gastrointestinal signals, they're called satiation signals because they tell you that you're feeling full, and the poster child has been CCK over the years. Call it the poster child because there are a lot of them, and we're going to see that in a minute. Let me make another couple of points about these kind of satiation signals. If you give higher and higher doses of CCK or any of the others prior to a meal, you get a greater reduction of meal size, but it never goes to zero. You cannot use these to prevent a meal from starting. When you eat is under different controls. How much you eat once you start is under the control of these. So here's a list of putative satiation factors generated as you're eating that are thought to reduce uh, meal size. I put ghrelin in a different color down at the bottom, in red, because it has the opposite effect. It also comes from the gut, but it seems to increase eating. And I'll talk a little bit about ghrelin at the end of the talk. As I'm talking, you will see asterisks appearing by some of these. Asterisks refer to compounds for which pharmaceutical companies or others are testing, or they're already in for use in humans, um, to either try and control food intake, body weight, or blood glucose. And many of them in humans uh, certainly are associated in the long run with some weight loss, but to my knowledge, there's no evidence, for example, that 
PYY or GLP-1 or amylin, all of which are given to humans and all of which may cause a little weight loss, that they do it by causing a reduction of food intake. I think that they work metabolically. Now, I'm skipping over the details of these because you can ask me that at the end. I'm trying to give you principles. So, what about this group of satiation signals? When humans get them, they simply report that they feel full or satiated. They do not feel sick. This is important. I mean, you know, if I were to inject CCK in you and you ate less, anybody would think, well, you just feel sick. And uh, that simply isn't the case. They work in humans. I'll just show you some data from CCK. These are all studies in which pe people, humans, got CCK just before they started a meal. Works in men, works in women, works in lean people, works in obese people. Many, many studies. Comparable studies have been done for many of the other satiation signals. They work fine in humans. This is an important observation. The question is, does your own CCK influence how much you eat every time you sit down to eat? And the way that you answer that is to block CCK's action just before when, uh, when you sit down to eat. And these studies have been done. Here's a study in humans, one of the early ones. Control day is on the left, a day when they got a CCK antagonist. On the right, the people didn't say they felt funny with the antagonist, but they ate a bigger meal. That indicates that how much they ate on the average is due to their own CCK. They could talk it, take out that effect and they eat a bigger meal. And again, that's been done for many of those uh, factors, the same kind of system. I think it's intriguing that these satiation factors not only arise from the intestines and so on as you eat, but they're also transmitters within the brain. Now, why don't we just uh, put CCK in food while well, you'd have to inject it, but can we give this to all of us before every meal and uh, why not just get us all slim and get rid of the obesity epidemic? Well, we answered this one way many years ago, uh, one of my graduate students. These were rats. They were in computer-controlled cages. They could eat whenever they wanted. As you can see, every time they ate in this, on the left, they got a control solution, and on the red, on the right, they got CCK. Every meal over the course of a week, when they got CCK, meal size was reduced. The dose was around uh, enough to knock meal size down by half. Well, that's great. The problem is they could eat whenever they wanted. And if you look at these rats, our rats ate around 11 meals a day normally. And over that week, when they were getting CCK, they ate around 22 meals a day. Now, I think that nutritionists can do the math. If you cut every meal in half and double the number, guess what happens to your body weight, right? <clears throat> they could keep up with this very nicely. This study was done with short-acting CCK, and many companies are now making long-acting formulations of these compounds in an attempt to see if uh, they can overwhelm the system and uh, control body weight. I'm skeptical, but uh, the data aren't in yet for many of these things. Now, I show this picture sort of shamefacedly. Um, my colleagues and I, in the around 10 or 12 years ago were asked to write a review of the controls of food intake in prestigious journals. This figure came from a paper in Nature. And the world believed this model. This, this model, this picture has been reproduced over 50 times by others. It's been cited 4,000 plus times. And I don't know if it's real. And I worry because I think the world got a misimpression uh, uh, when this happened. Oh, no, wait a minute, Ray. That's by my watch. I got seven minutes here. So this it. Let's get the Good try. <laughs> <laughs> the important thing about this model is there's a satiation system in circle from the gut to the hindbrain. 
And there's an adiposity system, circulating hormones that are secreted in proportion to how fat you are. Insulin and leptin are the poster child of this, but there's probably a lot of them. And they enter the brain, among other places, at the hypothalamus, and in principle tell you how fat you are. And it's a simple model, again, a negative feedback model. The amount of fat you've got in the body is shown at the bottom, stored calories. When you get fatter, you secrete more insulin and leptin into the blood. When you get thinner, you secrete less. The insulin and leptin get to the brain, influence food intake and energy expenditure, and tend to keep your weight constant. If you were to take an animal and put insulin or leptin into the brain, they eat less and lose weight over time. If you reduce the insulin or leptin signal in the brain, they eat more and gain weight over time. These are called adiposity signals as opposed to satiation signals. The problem with this model is it makes eating seem very deterministic, like we're robots responding to these things, and I don't think that's the way it is at all. There are lots of other factors, as I've been saying. Now you can hold it up. Fine. <clears throat> So how, do, how are these things put together? And I think that's an important question for all of us this morning. Homeostatic signals, insulin, leptin, whatever, feed into the brain directly into the hypothalamus, directly into the brain stem to influence eating. Satiation factors, CCK and these others, mainly feed directly into the brain stem. And the way it works is this. Adiposity signals simply change the sensitivity of the brain to satiation signals. And here's an example. Control food intake is shown in the dotted line at the top. You give CCK, you eat a smaller meal. Studies have been done. If you give a tiny amount of insulin or leptin to these, into the brain of these animals, so little that it does nothing by itself, it makes the CCK much more potent and you eat a much smaller meal. Likewise, if you can reduce the insulin or leptin signal, the efficacy of CCK uh, goes away. So the control is over these satiation signals, and one of the things that determine it is how fat you are. If you've gained a little weight, you've got more insulin, and it makes your CCK more potent, and you'll eat smaller meals in principle and, until your weight comes back. Now, the hedonic system, is the same for the most part. Whatever factors, emotions, stress, all of these things, again, feed in to meal size. I mean, meal size is the, uh, the point at which uh, food intake is determined. And again, remember, meal patterns don't seem to, uh, to mean that much. Further, and this is the, the newer stuff and the exciting stuff, we now know that adiposity signals, such as leptin and insulin, not only influence the homeostatic side, but they have a huge effect on the non-homeostatic side, particularly on things like dopamine secretion and things that make, make reward systems work. They're directly influenced by how fat or how thin you are. So, two more slides. We have a very complex calculus of signals influencing our food intake. I, you know, this slide simply lists off a, a litany of many of the different kinds of signals that are important. And what's happening now, and I think over the next decade, is going to be exactly how each of these signals interacts with both homeostatic and non-homeostatic controls. And I'm going to just end with one final uh, slide about the hormone ghrelin. I just used this as an example. I'm just going to show you data that I pulled out of the literature from the last two years to show you how this field is evolving. Ghrelin is a hormone made mainly by the stomach. It's also made in the brain. And if you were listening earlier, I said that ghrelin is unique because it increases food intake. If I inject it into you, when you eat, you'll eat a bigger meal. But if you know you're going to eat, ghrelin starts going up 
an hour or so before you eat. It goes up in anticipation of eating. Cephalic ghrelin, I would call it. It's caused by the time of day or your knowing. Ghrelin acts in the brain. You see all those stars? I'm, it's going faster than me. It was, I thought I'd be clever with those stars. But it, it primes you to get ready to eat. It gets your intestines and your pancreas and your liver ready to handle those foods when the ghrelin is active in the brain. It increases your sensitivity of smell so you can, uh, can identify food easier. It makes food taste better. Taste cells on the tongue synthesize and make their own ghrelin. I mean, this, uh, this is a very recent uh, thing. It enhances the reward value of food tremendously. Ghrelin is thought now to be an amplifier so that you'll eat more when the opportunity exists. And as a result, it does stimulate eating. And this is the tip of the iceberg. I could make slides like this for every one of those satiation factors. And so the point I want to make is the controls over food intake are probabilistic. They're not fixed. And I think that non-homeostatic factors easily overwhelm these and uh, this is probably what's determining the this, this so-called fluctuations of weight in a population. I think that the homeostatic controls are fine, but they're only apparent if you live in a very sterile, non-changing world. As long as you live with things happening, the non-homeostatic things will uh, overtake it. Thank you.